Good afternoon. Thanks, everyone. So uh, thanks for joining us this afternoon. And I'd like to begin by acknowledging and celebrating the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet today and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. For us today at ANU, we're gathering on the ancestral lands of the Ngunnawal and the Gambri people. For earth and environmental sciences, this is particularly important. In our national consultation for the Planet Research Data Commons, Indigenous Data Management, Governance and Recognition was consistently ranked as a key data challenge across our research infrastructures. This underlines the importance of understanding and recognizing the, envir the environmental management practices and knowledge that's been used to care for and to manage our environment. I'm Rosie Hicks, the CEO of the Australian Research Data Commons, ARDC. The ARDC has been enabled by the federal government's National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Strategy, or ENCRIS, and our mission is to accelerate research and innovation by driving excellence in the creation, analysis, and retention of high-quality data assets. So welcome to our ARDC Leadership Forum, where today we'll be discussing the approaches that can be taken to improve the collection and flow of environmental data and data products to enable optimum translation to government and to industry. This leadership forum intersects with the ARDC's strategy, focusing our expertise and our capability into thematic areas. The Planet Research Data Commons provides national scale data infrastructure for earth and environmental research and decision making and builds upon ARDC's previous work in earth and environmental related research data infrastructure. The Planet RDC brings together research, government and industry to develop systems and processes that make data more available, speed the development of analytics and models to understand the environment and address some of the most complex, interconnected and integrated challenges facing society. I looked at my notes. I'm going off script here. This is a really long list that they've given me climate change, agricultural productivity, biosecurity risks, a growing human population and related land use, change, land use changes, transitioning to new energy systems, declining biodiversity and understanding the importance of marine, coastal and freshwater environments for ecosystem services. It's a long list. Now we know why we're all here. And it's topical to host this event in Canberra, as we have really notable national environmental infrastructure and departments, including the recently announced Environment Information Australia in the Department of Climate Change, Energy, the Environment and Water, led by one of our panel members, Jane Corum. Thank you, Jane, for joining us. And of course, Ham Canberra hosts other major national environmental research infrastructures, including the Atlas of Living Australia, the Australian Plant Phenomics Facility, Access NRI, CSIRO, Geosciences Australia. Um, I'm also going to give a shout out to NCI because we've got Sean joining us this afternoon. Thanks for that, Sean. Um, and noting the world-class research that happens here at the ANU and at Canberra University as well. The environment has been classified as a system of systems. There's a pressing need for all of us across research, across government and across industry to work together to tackle that long list of significant issues. I look forward to hearing the insights from our panel members uh, this afternoon in streamlining data services, uh, data access, analytics and methods to enable the translation of our research findings and to support decision making in policy, in government and in industry. So I'm now going to hand over to Stephen Dovers, our facilitator for today. 
Stephen is an Emeritus Professor here at ANU at the Fenner School of Environment and Society. He's also a member of the ARDC's Research and Technology Advisory Committee. And so I am personally deeply grateful to Stephen for his contributions over the last couple of years on that committee, which um, has truly, Stephen, been one of the very best. Um, and he brings to that his expertise in environmental management, in policy, research and leadership. Stephen's an ecologist and a resource manager before joining ANU, where he was an inaugural ANU Public Policy Fellow. He's also a Fellow of the Academy of the Social Sciences in Australia and a Senior Associate with ITHA. So I'm very grateful uh, both to Stephen and to all of our panellists and I will now hand over. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much, Rosie. I'm a qualitative social scientist, so what am I doing here? Um, I'd reflect the um, acknowledgement of country and point out that we're belatedly in a time of some encouraging activity of actually incorporating First Nations knowledge, data, wisdom into our environmental information space. I'll um, have a few introductory comments, but first I'll introduce our panel uh, who I think span the continuum of what we're here to talk about today very well, from the production of data and insights from empirical research through frameworks and protocols for organising research, um, organize, uh, sharing data to the actual, possibly we hope, use of it in both public and private and community decision making. In order of their appearance, um, I'm sure you, you might have i um, seen Richard occasionally visiting Sydney, not a wetland somewhere um, out west, uh, from the a director of the Centre for Ecosystem Science at New, University of New South Wales, Richard Kingsford, is a river ecologist and conservation biologist who's probably seen um, more birds than anyone, all of us put together, uh, after quite a career with the New South Wales government, um, is, is now very much full-time active researcher with a great deal of influence and, I think, media profile. Michael Varden from ANU, uh, from sometimes from my own school, the Venice School, uh, is a very well-known environmental accounting researcher and um, well-versed in the collection of data, account co compilation and indicators. He led the Centre for Environmental Stats at the ABS for some time and has advised such bodies as the Bureau of Met, the UN, World Bank and the IMF. Uh, Kylie Galway is director biodiversity and nature positive leader at Oricon with a long 25 years experience in biodiversity policy and data. Kylie's passionate about designing and building practice that leads to environmental outcomes, positive outcomes. And at Oricon, she ensures the design, engineering and advisory companies team of ecologists to have the skills for now and into the future and lead services around nature positive strategies. And Jane Corum, uh, who is, how long have you been in this post? I'm just beginning my third week. Three weeks into um, being head of Environment Info Information Australia within the Federal Department. Um, has a very long career, an organisational leader in environmental sciences, director of CSIRO's Land and Water Business Unit, uh, chief, exec of the, uh, chief executive officer of the National Measurement Institute, acting chief scientist, GS. Geoscience Australia with a great deal of experience across this. So very much a freshly minted presence in this particular, or refreshed presence in this particular space. So I, I think it's a really dynamic time in Australia for environmental information and data. Apart from the ARDC's planet stream of work, um, which is led by Hamish here at the front, who I will call on to possibly say more of that, um, we have the emergence of Environment Information Australia rapid development around the world of the system of environmental economic accounts and cognate frameworks, an explosion of data availability and capacities, um, really is um, a buzz. We also have res excellent research capacities. Uh, in, I'm a qualitative, but I can do some analysis. And if you looked at our Excellence in Research Australia um, results and take the old, old codes of environmental science and management and ecological applications and say, on a basis of quantity, how many of Australia's universities could muster a submission 
and how many of them got five rankings, guess who comes out on top? It's environmental research in Australia, only challenged by sports science and nursing and allied health. Forget physics, forget chemistry, economics. We are actually incredibly good. We punch very much above our weight in that space because we've got fascinating environments. So it is very exciting, but I've been around long enough to have a small amount of cynicism. Uh, those who know me and see me in the cafe once a week know that I would be surprised by that. But, you know, the promised 1990 survey of land degradation to follow the 75 uh, to 77 one never happened. We had a first national water account study in 1975. We'd actually had one in 63, but they forgot. In 1993, at the first advisory committee meeting for the first State of Environment report, I said, what about the one we had in 86 and 87? And everyone had forgotten it. Land and Water Resources Audit came and went. That was world leading at the time. The critical input of long-term ecological research, well, we don't have enough, and what we do have runs on the um, smell of an oily rag. And some researchers are still actually reluctant to share their data, or even where their um, star pickets are. And ARC funding for environmental research has fallen over the last decade. And we've had some pretty good things like the NEGR and RDC and LWA to get shut down and then realise we missed them. And we're still struggling to align those timescales and motivations of researchers and data users and data custodians. I think what we have missed in the past are overarching organisation and curatorial frameworks and indeed cultural frameworks within which we can connect and collaborate. So to me, SIA, the ARDC, Environment Information Australia and others have the promise of that kind of broader infrastructure where we can keep at it and not let things slip as much as we have in the past. So now for our four excellent panellists. And for those online, please don't forget your Q&A tab, which has been monitored by Keith, who I've lost sight of, but I'm sure he's going to monitor it. He will. And we will go through till 3 o'clock, then have a short break so that you can refine your most difficult and challenging question, and then come back for a, a good three quarters of an hour of Q&A. Uh, so, Richard. Thank you very much, Stephen, and thank you, Rosie. And I'd like to acknowledge and pay my respects to First Nations people here in Canberra and all over those places that I roam <laughs> out there. Um, as Stephen said, I'm an ecologist and I'm very happy to be here and talk about some of the challenges in terms of data collection, management, analysis, and all the things that we do as ecologists. I'm really motivated by, uh, I guess, collecting data to impact on significant policy and management decisions, particularly in relation to where we see ourselves going in the future in Australia and how we restore some of the landscapes that we need to focus on. I am, um, as Stephen mentioned, I have counted the odd bird every now and again. And in fact, I've been leading um, probably one of the largest wildlife surveys in the world that covers a third of this continent. And we've been doing that survey for, this will be our 41st year. Uh, every October and November, we cover th um, the eastern side of Australia. Uh, we, we, um, every year we do, I think we've worked out it's 3,000 kilometres short of a round the world trip in a small aeroplane at 50 metres, counting 50 odd species of waterbirds. Now, I guess that's important. Long-term data is really critical in our highly variable system. And using that data to understand what the natural variations are and then what are the anthropogenic impacts and then how does that then tie into policy and management, I think, is some of the big challenges. Um, in oncology, we increasingly talk now about big data. Um, I'm across big data. I, one of the other projects I lead is uh, 
reintroduction project of locally extinct mammals in, up into northwestern New South Wales, which is called Wild Deserts, and we partner with uh, New South Wales National Parks. Um, we've got 60,000 camera trap images coming in every month, and we can't deal with them because nobody's developed the algorithms that we need to identify the different animals, not to mention how do we um, track cats and individual cats and then actually do something about them in real time. Then we use a lot of drone data. We're using drone data to count waterbird numbers with AI. Um, we're increasingly thinking about how drone data is useful for tracking vegetation at scale and linking that to satellite imagery. And then, of course, you know, there's remote sensing, which is um, one of our big challenges. Um, I'm part of a team that's a global um, initiative to look at how do we categorize ecosystems around the world. And over the last five years, about 40 scientists have been working on a classification of the world's ecosystems, and that was published in Nature last year, the Global Ecosystem Typology. Um, it's now been adopted as the IUCN standard for under the Convention on Biological Diversity, and that's going to um, register on a whole number of different ways in terms of how do we report on our ecosystems at jurisdictional and state levels and national state levels up to global levels. How do we use that map layer, which doesn't exist at the moment, to do our environmental accounting? And, and most importantly, I guess, in terms of all of this is how do we access, curate, make accessible to everybody transparently you know, that spatially explicit data that is critical for making decisions in places over time, but also across our nation. And how does that inform what we're doing? And lastly, uh, we're engaged with a really exciting initiative with the Nari Nari Tribal Council in terms of managing 80,000 hectares of the Murray-Darling Basin wetlands. And, and they're trying to manage data. They're trying to manage accessibility. How do they access data? How do they even know who's doing stuff on their land? And we're just starting to engage in that conversation about um, use of their data. How do they use that data to make good management decisions, but also make sure that people coming to them will give them back that data. So there's some interesting aspects that I know are sort of front and center of the future and how we manage those sorts of things. Thank you. Thank you. I just have to set up my timer because I'm at a lectern and I can talk forever. So I'll just make sure that I don't, and Steve will too. Oops, sorry. Uh, I've lost my timer. I've already wasted seconds. <laughs> okay, look, well, um, thank you very much. Thank you, Steve, for the, the introductions and, and to Rosie too from the ARDC for inviting us and, and to you, the audience. Um, I'm just going to dive straight in, <laughs> I think, and um, I'm going to talk to you mostly about the system of environmental economic accounting. I'm going to do so using an example. Uh, why am I doing this? Well, because the system of environmental accounting is the only international accounting standard in this space. I'm going to come back to that because this is a very confused space with lots of different things going on and no one is really sure how it fits together. Okay. We need to piece this together. So, so I'm going to start at the end. We're asked to think about that and, and what we really need. So I think what we need is direction. At the moment for environmental accounting, we're not quite sure what we're doing it for. Okay? We have in the Nature Positive Plan, we're going to put it into the system, uh, we're going to put it into the state of the environment reporting. Yeah, okay, once every five years it gets a gig. 
That's not what we need. We already have a state of environment report. This can do something different. This is not just going to tell us that the environment is getting bad in a different way each time. This will tell us how it's getting bad in a systematic way, regularly. Not just that, how it can fix it. Now, accounting is a jigsaw puzzle. It takes lots of bits of data. The framework, think of it as the box, jigsaw puzzle box. This tells you where everything goes. You open the box and there is a giant jumble of pieces and you don't know how to fit them together. Giant jumble of data direct from the environment, many different sorts, many different classifications, if only everyone would use the global environment typology. You know, we can add it to the five or six Australian typologies which already exist. So will the real typology start up? But that's one of the key challenges. How do we get everyone on the same page? How can we fit these bits of the jigsaw puzzle together? So we need to know what we're fitting together for what. We can certainly do state of the environment reporting. I think we can do a lot more. We'll certainly get to that shortly. For that, we need a process. We need to know how we're going to get there. For that, we need an infrastructure, administrative infrastructure. We've got the Environment um, Information Australia. We've got all of the agencies that Steve mentioned, all of the stuff which Rosie mentioned. We've got big data. What we don't have is big information. We need to sift it. We need to put it together. We need to understand it in a regular way. We need to be able to interpret it, which means we need to know what's a positive direction and what's a negative direction, how to intervene. So we then need to understand what we can actually do. It's more than state of the environment reporting. But we get information when you need it. State of the environment reporting is a great textbook. I recommend it to everybody, but it's out of date, usually before it's published because it's published at the discretion of the minister and the last minister decided we didn't need to see it for six months. The Bureau of the Statistics produces quarterly national accounts going back to 1956. That's what we need, time series which go a long way back. They've used lots of different information methods, data over time, but the time series goes back. That's what we're trying to do to get this curation. How do we get things going forward? So the next thing, what accounting isn't, and it's not about reducing everything to dollars. You say accounting, everyone thinks all we want is money. Okay, well, I do want money, but the accounting's not all about the money. There are five different sorts of the accounts. I'd love to go into them. Three of them don't involve money, and in fact, most people never get to the valuation part. Okay, we, it's not all about money. But then we get to our example, what could we do? Okay. So what could we do is put it into some sort of decision-making process which already exists, the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act. Got it up on the screen. I've got this typical policy cycle around the outside. It's got information at its centre. Okay. Basic data gets drawn into accounts. With this, we did the box gum grassy woodlands, critically endangered. A bunch of scientists decided it was endangered they got a Threatened Species Committee to recommend it to the Minister to be listed under the EPBC Act. Tick. Done. Process working so far. All the laws are triggered, including a plan for its protection. And anyone that wants has an impact on those laws has to apply for permission to have an impact. Okay. What we didn't find, it's good, we've, got, we've ticked the administrative boxes. We then, did anyone implement the plan? We went looking for information. We've got no idea that it was implemented. Doesn't mean it wasn't, doesn't mean that people didn't do anything, but we can't track any of that information to any of the action plan, okay? Problem, we need to be able to track what was done. Where, why, how, okay? Not only that, you can't find the administrative decisions you cannot search that database by the species or ecosystem which triggered the act. So if we want to go back and find all the offsets for the box gum grassy woodlands, we have to manually go through all of those files. Okay? So we didn't. We used a bit of machine learning, but that's a separate thing. Big data, big learning. Monitoring, no one monitored it to the best of our knowledge. We monitored it. Sorry, there's some sites set up long-term monitoring at the Fenner School, some of that. There was this remote sensing, we had some of that. 
we put it together, the best thing we could tell, that it was declining. It was declining in some areas, it was increasing in others. Why? We're not really sure. If we had proper accounts, we would know. If we had proper accounts, we could have targeted the implementation. We would have known where we could have saved the most for the least. We could have known where we could have saved the most where it was needed most. So all of that, if we can pull information, put it into a framework, then we might be able to take, do something with this and build it into the real world processes. So Steve's been quietly pulling me there. So I'll leave it with that. What we need is direction, we need processes, and we need to get more understanding of how it's going to be used. So thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So I'm here today to talk about how industry uses and displays data. So Kylie Galway, um, I'm representing Oricon and I'm the Biodiversity and Nature Positive Lead. So first of all, who's Oricon? Uh, it's a global environmental engineering consultancy firm uh, of about 700, uh, sorry, of, of about 7,000 employees. What do we do? We build big stuff to make it simple. Uh, we um, support many industries. From the building industries, they build big sta stadiums. We build big roads, big bridges, train lines. Um, we go through um, big renewables, big mining, um, and we also plan big precincts. So I'm taking data from a lot of different industry groups here. But the two main areas of interest where I work with in the data space is of course the biodiversity and the nature positive. So in the biodiversity space, which most people here will be familiar with, I have teams across Australia that undertake a range of ecological surveys, primarily for environmental assessments to enable their developments. Um, this requires data collection, data storage, presentation of the results, but ultimately this is to inform a regulatory decision on whether or not that development should go ahead. Now, the presentation of data is critical. Um, we need to make sure our regulators, which we have in the room here, um, are confident with the data that we've presented. And what we've done to increase that confidence is we've moved from the old-fashioned PDF, you know, those four, 500, 600-page reports, to digital reporting. So why do we use digital reporting? It's a way that enables us to link the text where you're reading the story, the map appears on the exact location. You can zoom in, you can zoom out, you can pan out to see how close that national park is. It takes you through tables, you can interrogate the tables, it does 3D mapping, it does sliders which shows you how um, change will happen over time. And we can add in temporal data. So what this does, it allows the regulator to interrogate that data and question specific areas that they may have concerns with. In the nature positive space, it's slightly different. We work with our clients to help them transition from an economic decision making to a nature positive decision making. So we work with them to understand what the impacts are on the environment and how they can address those impacts. So again, we do a lot of data collection, we do a lot of collation, a lot of storage, and again, presentation. But the presentation in this case is quite different. The presentation um, is digital right from the start, um, and because it's quite new, uh, we're just going straight in at that level. But what we're doing is the data there is slightly, it's a different audience we're dealing with. The audience there are not like our regulators that may have a massive amount of understanding of biodiversity. We have board members of the companies, we have the shareholders, we have the interested community. So we're presenting in some cases similar data but in a very, very different format. 
So for me, my role, um, not just about data, it's working out capabilities. What's the capabilities of my biodiversity and nature positive teams now, and where are we going to have to move our capabilities in the future? And one of the things that is at the forefront in my capability needs here is data and digital. So for me, the uplift is now. We need to not only uplift within our Oricon, but with our clients and with the parties that are involved around us. The value for me in getting this right, I'm representing consultancy, time is money. What can I say about that? Um, there is time to go and collect in the field. We need it captured immediately in the quickest way. We need it presented in the quickest way. We need those mo annual monitoring reports to be automated into dashboards. Um, also, making the right decisions. So for me, that is really, really critical. The better the data, the better the quality, the better the presentation, we will make the right decisions. And we can address some of those bigger data questions like assessing cumulative impacts. For me, two biggest challenges that I see from where industry stands here is around the data, um, the, the, the presentation opportunities are not thought about at the very early stage of data design. Presenting is something you do much later. It's an afterthought. Um, and that is where we're running into a lot of problems. The other fact is that many people here will know is that the data supply chain, even within Oricon itself, is siloed. You have your data capture teams, you have your GIS teams, you have your digital teams. And so how do we bring all those teams together to understand why are we collecting that data? Who is it for? And how should it be presented to get the right decisions? So for me, when I ask the question, research, what do we need? For us, for digital reporting, the tech is already there. It's wonderful. What's holding us back is our capability. It's the culture. It's us not actually embracing and using it. So I look forward to some of the great questions coming through in the sessions to follow. Thank you. Thank you, Kylie, and welcome, Jamie. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you. I'm very excited to be here. I'm extremely excited to be um, leading Environment Information Australia. Um, and as you know, this is still early days for me, for EIA, and also for what is a relatively new department in the Australian government. Um, I, too, acknowledge my um, the traditional owners of these lands. Um, I also particularly acknowledge the first and continuing environmental scientists and knowledge holders. And I pay my deep respects to their knowledge and their ongoing stewardship of our lands and waters and my own commitment to aligning and combining our knowledge systems and our environmental stewardship efforts. So for me, um, I am here representing EIA, but I've been bumping around the system of environmental monitoring reporting for, for long enough to have seen sh uh, other analogous endeavours live and die. So for me, it's a very personal motivation to seize this moment in time and the alignment of uh, government, research, private sectors in recognising that environmental data is critical to our business and the, the value and synergy of sharing it and sharing our endeavours. So for me, this is a really special moment in time. If we can get it right and connect across our sectors, across resources, across corporate sectors, um, bringing the, the higher end expertise of the research sector with the regulatory needs of government. Um, if we can get that right, if we can connect that data across systems, um, we can actually f build something where the whole is so much greater than the sum of the parts for er all the contributors and for um, society overall. So this is a, a really important sort of personal agenda for me, but also I think for everyone in this room, it's a moment in time. Um, to do that, we, we do need a number of things. We need, first of all, a sort of a mutual commitment to this um, endeavour, a mutual commitment to a shared endeavour. We need to be able to collaborate. 
We need to be able to respectfully recognise that different sectors will have different needs and indeed um, different objectives in um, accessing data and make sure that we can share it in a way that's respectful of all sectors. And I'm particularly mindful of First Nations in this space because if we're building a shared national environmental infrastructure, it needs to be for and with all Australians. Um, we, I believe that we really do need some national um, a framework to help guide it. And whilst EIA does not take necessarily priority in that framework, I think Environment Information Australia has a, an important role in helping set some of the, the, the basis for that framework. I think um, ultimately if we can position environmental data and environmental reporting in a way where it's actually usable in real time, where it's accessible, where um, it, it's interoperable, so different data sets from different um, sectors can be combined and used, then we can actually not only position, um, not only reap the benefits for research and for users of data, but we can actually um, start to reap the opportunities of high performance data, um, high machine learning, artificial intelligence, but also we can tap into the deep on ground knowledge of citizen science and um, ideally working with First Nations people, build something that's actually greater than Western knowledge alone. Um, so I guess in terms of my motivation, having spent too many years now, it's terrifying, um, 35 years or so, knocking on the door of um, policy from a science perspective, trying to get the importance of data recognised. Um, for me, I think we are in a moment of time where, that da where, where data is recognised as being important. The challenge is now, as that research, science, all sectors, providers of data, we're struggling to know how to find it. We're struggling to find know how to share it. We're struggling to be able to put our finger on it in the right time. And that's been the thing that's let us down, I think. Right now in EIA, and forgive the acronyms, we do work in them a bit much, Environment Information Australia, um, we've got the opportunity under the Nature Positive Plan of actually standing up data infrastructure that reports all the way up to Australian Government Treasury. So recently there's um, the report of measuring what matters. There's environmental indicators there that are com that enable us to use our data, our shared data assets, to actually speak to the highest levels of government in the land and to actually be accountable to all of Australia. So for me, that's a very exciting um, point that we're at, but we actually need to build momentum around that. We need to actually make that enduring. So we're aiming to legislate for um, the, the national environmental reporting. We also need to make sure that collectively, we are maintaining momentum around this because even where there are change of um, leaders, change of governments, change of um, political initiatives and organisational initiatives, if collectively we're keeping that um, ambition alive between us, I, I believe we can actually maintain this national environmental um, capability. That is going to mean that in future we can um, be in the, we can hold the state of the environment in the spotlight, and that's really important. So um, I'm trying. I'm trying to sort of win my way through the questions here. I think for us in Environment Information Australia, um, we're aiming to evolve from the kind of current state of play in environmental reporting, which is largely retrospective reporting on trends based on pulling together whatever data we can. Um, moving that to underpinning with reporting with um, really sustained and rigorous systems of reporting like environmental economic accounts applied at the national scale, like regular and um, state of the environment reporting and even a state of the environment dashboard. Now, I'd love to wave magic wand and do that right now. We're not going to be able to, but over time, my hope is that that's what we can do and it will put those, the condition and trends of the environment in the spotlight. As I say, we've taken the first step in doing that in Treasury's recent, recent measuring what matters. Um, we have pilots for um, environmental impact 
accounting, sorry, environmental economic accounting, and we have the framework of the state of the environment reporting. I'm really keen that um, we actually put a lot, of, a lot of substance behind those and stand them up as regular national reports. Um, I've got to tell you, it's very early days. Um, in the Department of Climate Change, Energy, the Environment and Water is still quite a new department and that, that actually takes its toll on how quickly we can stand it up. So for me, I think the real opportunity is re ideally realising the synergies that operate between sectors because in many different sectors there are huge strides that have already been made around shared environmental data um, and analytics and reporting. Um, I don't think we need to reinvent a whole new wheel. So for me, the real opportunity is how can we stick that together? And I think that's something that we're all grappling with. How can, how can we you know, realise those synergies? Um, there are gaps in the landscape, but I think um, within DQ, it's the, our opportunity and our contribution can be helping to set the framework. So we will be legislating national environmental data standards. They're, not, they're going to be the beginning of the story, not the end of the story, um, but that's actually setting a standard of expectation for data that is ideally provided to the regulators, but also that we release, and our job will be to release accredited data. Um, I hope that can flow all the way through the system, and ideally, if we're um, a, a, a coherent system, those standards are reflected in all our um, our activities in um, a CRC activities, increase funded activities, that we're actually reflecting those um, standards. Um, we can legislate around those things, but I think a lot of it comes down to the people making it happen and having a shared commitment across our sectors. I do deeply feel that there is a missing voice at the moment in this shared vision and it's First Nations voices. Um, and so I think with you know, how we can walk with First Nations um, data efforts and ideally achieve synergies is another really important thing. And I think for us as data creators and data users, as Kylie said, the communication of that is really important too. So that we're not just an echo chamber and we all get the value of data and um, we don't want this shared sort of vision and hope to fall by the wayside again because people who are not from that background and not scientists, not researchers, don't actually see the value of it. So I think that um, culture and that commitment to communicating and making sure that users understand what it means, not just presenting data, is really important. So I've probably run out of time, I suspect, Michael, but um, I, I really thank you for coming. I really hope that we can collectively build something that's greater than um, the sum of our own organisation's objectives and motivations. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jane, and the other three panellists. <coughs> I've been to, we've been trying to do this for 30 years. You've been there three weeks. You know, um, <laughs> it's <laughs> not an easy gig. Um, we've, we're actually running a tiny bit ahead of time, so I'm going to throw one question to the panel, and then we'll have a, some discussion here, and we're monitoring online. Um, I think our microphones will come on, or okay, use that. Um, I just to kick things off, and then we we have a break, and then we'll come back for a you know a good forty minutes of more discussion. <coughs> Where is that clever question? Um, trust. I think I'm the first one to use the word today. Thank you, Hamish. You put it on my 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 notes. But a key issue is trust in, in between researchers of data, of collaboration, in curation, accessibility, everything. Um, anyone on the panel or all, what, um, do you have any comments on the, the key issues for as we build hopefully this all singing, all dancing integrated system of, of issues of how to gain trust, to maintain trust between any of those moving parts? Everyone trusts accounts, don't they? An accountant, so yeah, that's an easy answer. Oh. Kylie, you did. Yeah, uh, for trust, um, I think where we're going to be pushed to move faster is the increase in social licence. 
Uh, so we have a very strong public and community group out there that do want to see data. Uh, they're getting very savvy. They know how to read data um, and they're expecting more from it. So for me, um, the task force for nature financial related disclosures um, is one of the, the great frameworks coming through that are going to make um, or industry, for example, um, really show what impacts they're doing and what are they doing about that. So I actually think there are mechanisms out there um, that are forcing people to really uh, put their data out front and really let the public actually um, scrutinise it. So I, I, th I think we're being forced maybe from outside to move quickly in that area. Jane and Michael. Um, I, I probably come at trust from a couple, couple of different angles. The first one is trust for sharing of data. And I think this is a really um, big challenge because well, researchers don't necessarily want to share data. Project proponents don't necessarily want to share data. First Nations don't necessarily want to share um, data. So there's, there's, there's a real issue in how do we store and provide access to data in a way that protects commercial and intellectual property um, ownership. So that's one thing, and I think that's, that, that is going to be one of the things we're going to have to grapple with, but it is a broader issue of who, who gets to see the data. But the other one is the other aspect of trust is in using data and whether users will actually trust it. And it, it is a very qualitative thing, but again, um, in our space, I think that's very much where it's critical we have um, explicit data standards that speak to not just, that are multi-criteria and speak to things like how was the data collected, how representative is it, how co comprehensive is it, who collected it, how current is it, and those sorts of things. And I think this is where we do need to provide guidance, and us as, us as sectors actually collectively, what, what data is good data for this particular use? And that's going to be the challenge for us in um, making sure that data is fit for purpose whilst not making the bar so high that we end up having no data that's considered to be any good. So that's going to be something that we're grappling with. But I think more broadly, I think we're all grappling with at what, how much data is enough and how good is good enough for making decisions right now. Of course, no environmental or earth system data has ever been subject to conspiracy theories on the splinter net on anti-social media. Michael. Yep. Um, Look, thank you. Yeah, some of what I was going to say has already been said, but I think here we get to confidence in the systems and the processes and the institutions. I mean, why do you trust that GDP is right? It comes out every quarter, it gets reported on the news. Does anyone stop to think if they got it wrong? We trust the ABS to get it right, rightly or wrongly. We trust them. I work there. I trust it. Okay. They have processes. They have data quality assurance standards. It's not subject to ministerial sign-off. Good or bad, the data comes up. You have to trust the institutions, you have to trust the processes. Coming then back to this frameworks, different task forces and things, okay, voluntary standards. Do we want voluntary standards set by the industry? Do we want single materiality? Are we only interested in the financial risk to them? Are we interested in the financial, in the risk that they pose to the environment? So it's not what some of these others, and there's many. There's the International Sustainability Standards Board, there's the Global Reporting Initiative, there's the um, Business and Biodiversity Assessment. Will the real framework, real set up, stand up? It doesn't matter. What we want is the Australian Accounting Standards Board to say, if you're gonna report on this, you do it like this. And then you don't get greenwash. And there is a Senate inquiry at the moment about greenwash. So how do we stop that? We need trust in the processes, trust in the institutions. Uh, look, I, I think um, trust is important and to go to perhaps something that Jane was saying in terms of as a, somebody who produces research data, I think the research community is getting better. It hasn't been very good for a long time in terms of things in bottom drawers and, and all of that sort of thing. But you know, most journals now are requiring you to publish your data and your code so people can repeat um, your analysis, which I think is a great thing. I think the, the major issue that researchers have 
with sharing data is, apart from wrangling it, is, is essentially one of losing their core reward structure and you know, the, the ability to turn that data into a publication which is essentially part of your career and someone else step in before you do that is one of the major challenges for researchers. But I think particularly with long-term data that's so important, researchers have to be able to say, this is now in the public arena and others can do things with that data that I or someone would never have thought of. I think the other thing that I'm, that's happening more and more is that researchers are getting rewarded for data sets and you know in in the sort of citation metrics that's sometimes an obsession within the academic community that that's also important so thinking about some of those reward structures around use of data and acknowledging where it's come from is important um, one aspect that of trust which we haven't really talked about is this issue of uncertainty and how do you capture uncertainty in data? And that really is also about trust because people don't necessarily always understand that a line on the map is a fractal line and it depends on the scale that you're looking at. And um, communicating that uncertainty I think is going to be really important in terms of getting community trust and um, people supporting the sort of data that's being collected and being used to make some of those big decisions that are inevitable as our planet gets affected more and more by the Anthropocene. Thank you all four panellists. Uh, we come to one minute to go, uh, so I think we'll, we'll have our break. I believe there's afternoon tea for 15 or 20 minutes and then come back for a good three quarters of an hour of discussion. Um, I think just to draw two dots is how do we make decisions without waiting forever for perfect data and the matter of uncertainty. And I'm, if we had a um, high court judge here, they'd explain what beyond reasonable doubt and on the balance of probabilities is. But the standard of proof upon which a particular decision can be made is something that I think across science, law, accounts, the media, the Senate chamber, we all have really quite different understandings of what, a, what a, a decent level of certainty is for a particular purpose. So, but the only certain thing is that we'll break now. Have a cup of tea. Thank you. So we're, we're going to open up now. Um, I will throw some questions later to specific people who I will demand speak, but for the moment, we'll just open up um, we're monitoring online and Keith will tell me where we have fabulous questions from somewhere out there in the blogosphere, but for now, at least, I will just look for hands that pop up in the audience. Come on now. Richard. example uh, and that is X or Twitter as it was known um, it is one of the biggest data collecting uh, particularly at the citizen level but also at the scientific level uh, mechanisms that is out there and I've got no doubt that 99.9% .9 repeater of the data is just opinion and you can get addicted to giving opinion. I'm really good at it. But in amongst all of that is really, really, really useful stuff. And that 0.1% of stuff that might be really useful 
could be a greater amount of data that's collected free compared to all the investment that's being made into formal, uh, you know, formal uh, data collection models. So going back to my question, how can we make for all people, scientists, regulators, mums and dads, etc., an addiction and worthwhile? What's the reward? I'm not going to guess who is most addicted to collecting data on this panel. <laughs> But just open the panel generally. It, it's a, it's a nice one. Some people aren't into this. Some people are. How do you how do you get them hooked, Michael? Yeah, well, I think it's all about the payoff. It's not about the data. It's about what you get from the data. So I think you need to work backwards. What do you get from it? So the reason we have the economic information system is it supports a giant economic decision making system. What's our giant environmental decision-making system? We actually have a decision-making system which has learnt to work without data, so it doesn't need data. So that's a cynical view, but I think that you've got to get to start from how you use it rather than, you know, it's what, what you get out of it, not what you have. It's just three iterators of the problem. Yeah. So, <laughs> no, no. So you start with the, you have to have a decision-making process. So you start with the decision-making process and walk back to the data you need, which some of which will be the data you have, some of it will be data you don't have or information you don't have. We'll make a distinction between data and information here because sometimes we've got this massive big data, but what's the signal from the noise? There's all sorts of things we can get out of that. Um, but it's pulling out of all of that big noise the information it actually feeds in. So once you've got a system which can use the data, you then get addicted to the data and it can't work without it. But at the moment, we, you know, it's, we start, that's why we've done lots of projects with First Nations, with different um, decision-making processes to see how we can work backwards from the decision to the data. So, you know, so that's my solution is to work backwards uh, so that the payoff is clear from the beginning. Just jump in. Yeah, look, for me, is where's the social scientist? Um, we quite often don't have social scientists on our projects, and we really need to understand human behaviour. It drives everything. Uh, putting back my old policy hat on, like waste. Why do people throw rubbish out? If you understand the whys, rather than jumping straight through, we're going to increase fines, we're going to put this fence up. Let's have a start. Why? So in regards to, yeah, data collection, why do we want them to collect data? Let's understand the human first and start bringing more social scientists into our projects, just not data people, just not environment people. It's a multidisciplinary problem, this is. I and the Academy of Social Sciences, thank you for those comments. <laughs> Richard or Jane? Okay, thank you. Um, I could say, but why wouldn't you want to collect data? But that might just be um, the sort of a slightly skewed perspective. Look, I think people are innately data collectors. If they can see that there's a place where it can be being used, people will contribute it. But we don't necessarily have the foolproof systems for people to contribute their data. So um, ALA is doing a fabulous job of you know, convening citizen science. There will be others. From where I sit, I think there's still probably not a high enough profile where people can see that they can contribute to, and that's part of the challenge. But I also do think, going back to my, well, why wouldn't you collect data? I think we are all innately scientists and data collectors, but I think we need to celebrate that right starting from the very, you know, grassroots primary school level at high school level. When we're training people in their rudimentary science, we celebrate data collection and stewardship as sort of part of the hallmark of being good scientists. And then in science, in tertiary institutions and science organisations, we, we reward good data custodians. Um, we actually reward people who publish their data as well as who publish in science journals. Um, and we actually celebrate, pe you know, data custodianship as a, a sort of an organisational um, strength, just as we would celebrate, you know, inclusive culture and things like that. I think we've actually got to, you know, reform the whole culture so that we recognise that it's a national good. But we also need, as well as the culture, we need somewhere for people to contribute and we also need systems so that those data are being served up in a way that can be ingested and is usual, usable. And that's you know, something we'll be grappling with too. So I, 
we just don't want everyone's random data. We need them to you know, provide us in the right form. So I think that's part of the challenge. But yes, there's a huge wealth out there and we could even be being more directive in encouraging people to not just throw up any data, but actually to help us in our environmental monitoring. So there's a huge opportunity there, but it is culture and systems together. Richard, any hints from, well, is there a data uh, anonymous group that, is, that deals <laughs> with people who are addicted? What are addicted? Um, I, th I think citizen science tells us a bit about how people can get interested. And I think it's about their passion, but it's also how do they easily collect that data and what do they get back from it? Um, we've been working with social scientists um, with the Australian Museum's Frog ID to try and work out what motivates someone to go out and could you motivate them to go out somewhere where you've got no data? So. I think some really interesting aspects around that. I think um, for professional addicted data collectors like me, um, I think a lot of it is about what's happening to your data. Is it being used? Is it, um, do you get that sense that you are actually making a difference? And, and that's about that data being accessible. It's about that data being talked about in policy and management and sometimes even hardwired in there. I think the other challenge is, particularly when you've got long-term data, we've been collecting this data for 40 years. That's a lot of different agencies. Um, at various stages, middle managers have come up with a new shiny thing and they want to throw out the old. So there's some issues around, particularly environmental data, how do you collect data and support those long-term data sets that give you that time series that really is able to measure change? And then what are the key indicators that can, because we can't measure everything. So we want to find that sort of basket of goods, if you like, in terms of CPI indices that can tell us um, something about the environment and people say, yep, this is what's going on in our environment. Hey, Keith, is there anything coming? Good, a good one from which is one of our virtual attendees. Hello, all yes, of you. We, out have, there. we have a question from our virtual, one of our virtual attendees, and this one's specifically to, to Jane. Um, so this is around, will Environmental Information Australia encourage development and management of information to move decision makers from positions of unsustainability, as well as innovations and entrepreneurial perspectives on moving sustainability forward in a positive, transformative way? Um, it's a good question, and I don't know that I have the answer for it, but I, be I believe that the first step in change is being able to see the state of what you're trying to change. So for me, um, decision makers can't make a decision if they don't have, you know, or they, they actually frequently have to make a decision in the absence of data. But a decision that's grounded in understanding the current state situation is much better than one that isn't. Will it lead to innovation? I'm sure it will, both in the, you know, the, in, in many sectors. So I think it will. So I don't think, I think there's only yes, yes, yes in answer to that question. But EIA is not going to be making those changes. We're going to be providing the information and then it's for decision makers to, um, to use that information. Yes, um, a comment on that from anyone else in the panel? You. Uh, I, I, I think there's, um, uh, I think there's an interesting space here between the different data collectors, gatherers, thinkers, um, where government can sometimes say we've got the way to do it or CSIRO or so. I think it's important to sort of think about how some of the university sectors can also collaborate. And I think um, there was a discussion about how do we develop this mutual trust? Because that's fundamentally important, I think. And that's not just about data, it's also about how we conceptualize the use of data and what sort of pipelines might be coming on board that help us um, making these systems interoperable, which is, um, so, and I always think that not everybody's gonna have 
all of the data in the world or all the data in Australia. It's actually how do you get that spatially explicit data pipelined in for the space and the time that you want to look or the issue that you want to look at. And you might find that it, some universities got that data, but how do you get that data to the point of considering, analyzing, and then providing the information to decision makers? And, and I think that's a challenge and probably an interesting space for um, Jane's uh, organization in, in, in building some of that capacity as well. I recall a very senior European research manager and leader who moved to Australia and after about three months said, yeah, this is across 27 countries, said collaboration is the utter first theme of doing things in Europe. If you put in a single bid from a single institution, it's like, okay, what's wrong with you? Yeah, you know, it's, it's not done. And he said here it was suddenly competition. This is a person who worked for peak bodies. So that does bring up the... Has anyone read the discussion paper on the university's accord? I don't think it mentions long-term ecological data, but anyway. Um, but we are looking at restructuring some of the motivations and incentives in that space, and that's just the research space which, which you've mentioned. All these moving parts, um, any comments from the panel on that? What shifts do we need in the, if you like, the motivational model or the incentive structure set in different parts of it from so we have, we always say, oh, government agencies, but we have the ones that are purely to provide information, not to make decisions. We have regulatory ones who don't make policy, but implement what's there. Private sector is very diverse. You know, the, the, the custodians and organisers and accounts of data in the middle. Any comments on where you think a shift in the motivational or incentive structures could work? As, you know, I know as a long-term person in a university system, Funny thing was, I tended to get on better with people outside my own university, but the, the incentive was not to collaborate other than at the margins for a centre of excellence or something, for the big carrot. But any, any thoughts on whose mindset could you really like to tweak to make something happen in this space? I mean, I, mean, I, I think you, there are you know, the money bits, but I don't really think that would make it happen. I actually think you need the technology that says this is a part of Australia, how do I contribute my data to that? And if we had ways of doing that in time and space, I think you might then get the buy-in. And then you would realise which data sets are important and which aren't. And I was actually going to ask Vicky, this issue of um, environmental assessments, there's a huge data set there that doesn't really go anywhere. And you know, when there's an environmental assessment, no one actually looks at what the environmental impact is afterwards. There's a lot of work done before, but not necessarily afterwards. And a lot of that data tends to get tied up within the industry processes and is not transparently available. Even though it might be collected for a particular important reason, um, it's just a wealth of data there. I had noted that down as a question, and Richard has now asked it for me, which is excellent. More than happy to answer that. Yeah, look, it's a really good question, and uh, we are actually starting to see the change now already coming through with some of our clients. Um, it's primarily driven by social li li license um, in the fact that their community is so strong, they may be opposed to the development. Um, and so they're really forced right at the early stage of the very first surveys to actually showcase that. Then um, what the um, uh, environmental impact assessment um, is showing, what was the information that puts in there, um, if the development's been allowed and the conditions then followed, the monitoring that needs to go through. So this is where we've definitely embraced the digital reporting that can actually take um, the interested audience through that entire story. So you've got data that builds on and builds on and builds on from each other. Um, how do we get that out? That will be out visually to be able to see by some of the, the clients. 
Um, and it's really important that we celebrate those early adopters, um, the ones that are showcasing sometimes, yes, there will be, there is an impact. This is what they're doing to help. Um, I'm talking much more than just offsets. Um, but yeah, brave enough to put that information out there um, to show that this is what their damage will be, this is what they're doing. Um, and then when more and more people see that, um, it'll become, I'm hoping, then more of a norm, that it will be expected. And if you don't have that data, then the question will be, why don't you have the data to show what you're doing? And I think, again, bringing in that social science, people want to, want to know. They don't want to have things hidden. They prefer to know what is there, what's being done. Um, and particularly now with the technology of drones and things like that, they can now go to find you know, that was an offset site. This is a drone. Uh, what's going on here? So it's better to be honest up front. And we, we are starting to see that with our clients. Someone else on the floor here? Yeah. Yeah, we'll just get it. Hello, uh, my name is Lou from Deloitte Australia. Um, so about a month ago, I was with LA. So that's probably more of a question along that those lines. And then for Richard, but then any other panelists is welcome to to pitch in for that thought. So you were Richard, you were talking about the now it's more encouragement around the the, the for the scientists to publish data, and then because they got citations and all that kind of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And then. I, I guess one of the, uh, that's awesome. I guess one of the thing is that's still silo data, still oh. sort of, right? That sort of data sitting somewhere in, this, in a spreadsheet where it takes a lot of energy for people to discover that. And then actually data makes more impacts if they're kind of bundled together, right? So, so have you seen any moves or incentives around the research community or the industry that, that has uh, uh, like encourage, promote people from actually how to move that data together rather than sort of everybody upload their own spreadsheet on a, on a, on a, on a, on a website? Uh, <clears throat> it's a very good question. I don't think I've seen a lot of that. It's starting to happen. Um, and I think that's coming with the development of the tools to do that. So things like Google Earth engines allowing us to pull in data sets at larger scales. Um, there are, I mean, I mean, there's always been this issue of paywalls, particularly in peer-reviewed journals, and some of those, uh, you know, with open access uh, dissolving, or the researchers have to pay now for people to make money. <laughs> um, but there are those data sets on things like Figshare, but they're not, as you say, very discoverable. And so I really do think the, you know, to me, the technological solution is how do we work out ways for people to contribute their data in space and time. And I'm not sure what that mechanism is, but to me, that would provide an opportunity to do that. Um, and, and I think researchers will jump on board if they've got a mechanism. They won't necessarily need money to do that. It's actually, how do they do that? And that you might get more collaboration across the whole sector or across you know, industry, um, universities, non-government organisations, if they're able to do that sort of thing. I, I, I can feel an offering coming here from Michael. Yeah, uh, no, well, it's, um, it's not directly on that, but it's sort of coming out. But it's this difference, we're talking about research all the time. And I think there's a difference between research and monitoring. <laughs> And sort of monitoring the information you know you need, so you want to keep it going. The research perhaps leads you to the other information you need but don't have, and perhaps you get the better methods to do that. So I just can't, you know, there's this thing, there's research done by scientists, by researchers, and then there's monitoring, which is done by other people. And it's then how do we get this monitoring, which is done for, you know, it's a standard, well, I hope it's a standard form, which then gets plugged into a standard form um, in the Department of Environment. There's issues there with confidentiality, but then you can put these little pieces of the puzzle into a bigger piece, and then hopefully you get landscape management, landscape data from elsewhere, people like Richard, and others, and if there are gaps there, you can ask the research community, can you fill these? And you know, it becomes the Creative Commons, I don't really want to use that word, but I just did. Um, yeah, but it, people can fill gaps that they can see are needed, either in the landscape or in the, the different 
domains of research, for want of a better word. So, so the gaps force us to ask the questions. It, yep. it exposes the questions consistently to us. Other comment on that, um, Tika Richard? I was just going to say we have two fabulous WA representatives here, Wobsey and Wombsey, um, who for me are showcasing some of the data um, collect, you know, collective, getting digital data groups together, such as mining. I'm not sure if we can reverse it and ask them to respond to the question. Um, but yeah, I'm really seeing there are some really good groups out there that are addressing how do we get different groups to come together to share the data. Um, and they're doing it well by selling the value of what that data is and how it benefits other groups. So yeah, Lou, I, I think I, it is happening and there's some great examples in the room. Given, given one of my set questions, and the other three can be forewarned because Kylie's given us one, is can you think of some really exemplars out there that capture in some way what we should do? So certainly a voice from the West. We have, look, it's a federation. Uh, we, have, we have to keep the, the outlying states happy. Technology. We don't really maybe have that out west yet. Um, no. Uh, thanks for, for highlighting uh, the work that's being done uh, in, in WA through WOBSI, WOMSI, West Australian Biodiversity Science Institute, uh, Marine Science Institution, uh, along with our partners in, in government. Uh, and you know, a number of the streams of the conversation about capturing uh, the, the work that environmental consultants do in. Um, in doing environmental impact assessment and passing it through to our, our regulator in DOOR, um, Department of Environment and Water. Uh, and, and we now see through the establishment of IPSA uh, and IMSA, the Biodiversity in, Index of Biodiversity Surveys and Assessments, around $100 million of survey effort every year is being captured uh, and becoming a public asset, uh, which is available or becoming available to the research community, to, to the consultants. Uh, that's $100 million of effort that previously was going, to use uh, Richard's example, into someone's bottom drawer. It was, the survey was being done, it was informing a figure in an EIA document, which the consultant would hand to the regulator, who would mm. then look at it and go, yes or no, but the data was gone. Uh, so uh, over the last three years, that's been in effect. We're now working on the tools to actually enable the research data, the modeling, identify the gaps to then to come into that. So um, there, is, there is light at, at the end of that tunnel of giving people the opportunity to contribute their data and see what the value of it is. Do you want to add anything, Luke? Yeah. Sounds about well. So thanks. And Kilbert area where you have very big mining with very big interests um, in, in making sure they can get their resource out, that they have impacts over catchment scale yet they can't share information through various reasons, but mostly collusion. Um, but by sharing it through an independent facility that can house that information and then build the tools that they need, you can put that data to use. So we're trying to run a case study through Wobsey in the Pilbara to do that. And in the marine space, we're looking at Coburn Sound where there's an incredible amount of existing information and huge new development in that area, $15 billion over the next 10 years of industry. So we're collecting new data streams that fill the data bucket so that we can build the tools like hydrodynamic models or noise models or um, habitat maps. So we, we're getting a really good regional description um, and real-time information going into modelling so that we can do things like cumulative impact assessment. Thanks, thanks very much. And we have a, a question just behind. And then I was going to put you on the spot, Hamish, if that's OK. Yeah, Max. Okay, thanks, too. Yep. We had a, a hand up before. Thanks. My name is Greg Terrell. It actually follows very much on from the discussion we just had. And it was related to the title of this session, which is Translation Pathways Between Three Sort of um, Groupings. And the question is yeah, well, it seems to me we've explored quite strongly the public availability for reuse of research data. I think we just heard the WA example where there probably are translation pathways in. in um, in place, and the question is, uh, have we fully explored what a translation pathway is, the extent to which we, we've got what we need, um, and what are the gaps? What, what does that look like? That was, the gaps one is interesting. Okay, now, any, any responses to this one? Yeah. The translation pathway and the gaps. Jane. I'll have a go. 
I mean, it may sound a little bit like blowing the same trumpet, but I think we, we are lacking systems and processes for um, affecting that translation. I think we're at the starting blocks in that there is a congruence of motivations to do make the translation, but I think we're still very early days in terms of having the mechanisms to do that, and that's why I guess this is the beginning of the conversation. We could just sit around and spin our wheels and, and admire the problem forever, and it's a massive problem, and, and that would be a shame. I think what's actually has been achieved in WA, and that was going to be my example too, so you saw that one, is a spectacular example of where there has been translation across sectors. But to me, we have to have the right... Um, motivation, first of all, which I think we have, we then got to have the right uh, well, roadmap to, to or a, a sort of a national strategy to engage the different players or a strategy across sectors that actually speaks to that motivation and unpacks it into um, what we're actually going to do about it. But there are some really systemic things that come down to um, formalising data standards, what the culture is, the organisational um, messaging around um, how we implement and value data standards and implement it, um, but also a commitment to sort of sharing and, and a shared outcome as well. So we lack all of those, those sort of the cultural and the structural elements to do that at the moment. However, um, the, I think we're at the first. We're at the right place to actually talk about how we make that happen. And I know, whilst in Environment Information Australia, we're a piece of the puzzle. Um, ARDC is doing a fabulous job within the research sector of actually com, um, building that momentum internally. I, I think there is a real value in us setting up um, some sort of um, governance around how we might make it work across sectors as well as within sectors. Um, but these are all just starting thoughts at the moment. Well, I'm going to jump in. Can I jump in? Well, could I introduce... Um, Hamish is the director of the Planet um, Research Data Commons, of which there are lovely descriptions on the table as you walk out, with, with more sub-programs than we can poke a stick at. But I, I think a, a comment about... I've only been involved with ARDC in a marginal way for a couple of years. It's fascinating to actually discuss what I'm familiar with, which is long-term environmental monitoring and research and environmental data, in an, in a, but in a context where you can actually talk about health. You can talk about totally different domains of data. And I would throw out the idea that one of the silos we have is not thinking about data information to decision pathways just in environment, just in ecology or just in water, but actually go, hey, what's a cohort study? Oh, that's interesting. That's what health people do. And there's all sorts of commonalities and contrasts. So I, I think it's, uh, we've got to focus today. But I think ARDC and there are other you know, ways of doing this to get a, an actual sense of, is what we have in front of us really that different? Are there answers out there that, have, that other disciplines and sectors have already done? But Hamish from the planet. Thank, thank you, Stephen. Uh, Hamish Holler, ARDC, Director of the uh, Planet Research Data Commons. and. Um, and thank you to the panel and, and the discussion and the people here and, um, and the 150 people online as well, actually. Um, Stephen, I think that's actually a really, really pertinent question about combining uh, across those domains and across those disciplines. And particularly when we look at the value system that drives the impact. So what are we actually kind of valuing? Why are we collecting this data? And what is the insight and knowledge that we want to get from that? And generally, the environment doesn't exist by itself. We know that. That's, that's an, a complete theoretical construct as such. It's always there to support and be productive and sustainable. That's what we actually kind of want. And that includes, um, as Richard would say, anthropogenic kind of changes in our kind of use of the environment. And thinking that through in terms of how do we define those data needs and those data questions, both the analytics and the research that kind of goes behind it is a story that we actually really need to be telling a lot more better. And if I take our example of the work that we have been doing with Wobsey and Wamsey um, around the Pilbara region there, and why that has been so successful, it is because it says those, uh, it tells that story from both an environmental, social, and economic perspective. 
it also talks about the value proposition of getting these translation pathways correct and right. So for research, it's showcasing how my research will actually impact decision making in these particular regions. So that's both my data, but also the models and the knowledge that I generate around that region. For industry, it's quicker and faster decision making, it's more robust, and meeting our social license for ESG reporting, as Kylie kind of said, dollars and time, really. And for government, it's, it's about robust, repeatable methods um, and accessing that wealth and advantages within the research sector. So if we take the Pilbara example where there's $100 billion worth of infrastructure that's going to be developed over the next 10 years, um, when we talked to the, the state you know, at our last workshop, there was 50 data providers immediately that came out. They said, yes, we want to be involved, we just need the framework to be involved. And how our data is handled and how our data is treated and also, we want a common language to be able to talk that through. So from, from in the um, planet's perspective and, and the work done with Wobsey is around the shared analytical framework for the environment. So what is that common language that we can all look towards and have a roadmap towards actually rolling that out in another region? And when we talk about those regions, it really gets people interested, very involved. Uh, East Gippsland, the Gippsland area is another area, um, the Northern Rivers, South East Queensland, we've seen these kind of pressures and these drivers which really kind of force that integration of data and force us to be thinking about those new methods um, involved in that. So I think, I think we don't tell that story enough and what are those data needs that, and how do we get those providers involved? Having the infrastructure behind that, we've got largely got that a lot of the infrastructure behind it, but it's having the, the same language that we actually kind of use. How is it shared? How's the data shared? Is it private? Is it collaborative? How's the analytics of that shared as well? And then I think as we go up that chain, when we think about those models and the analysis that is done by that, and looking at Michael here, what is the methods and how do we communicate and describe those methods that we have a commonality across our analytics and modelling pipelines. So level zero all the way up to level four, which is endorsed by the UN as a, as a method. And I think there are some of the fundamental components that we need to get in place to actually kind of help this out. So it's probably a question back to Michael. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so here, uh, there's a lot to unpack in that question, so, but I'm going to drive this back. It's people tend to focus on methods and data, but you need metrics. So what are you going to measure it in? So you need a concept to measure. And so we get back to this language, the translation. What do we mean? So we have the global ecosystem typology which is used by the people who use the global ecosystem typology. I'm sorry, I can't remember the WA's classification for vegetation, but I know they have one. But New South Wales has their own, Victoria has their own, um, and the ACT has their own. No one uses the same thing, so their classifications don't talk to each other. They're speaking a different language. Now, sometimes you can translate, doesn't matter. I call it water. Somebody else might call it agua, leo, whatever it is. We can sort that out. But the problem is if we start using different metrics, <laughs> Okay, so, you know, and there's some things you can use an inch to measure a length or you can use a centimetre. That doesn't matter, but are we measuring length? And this is where I think the accounting comes in because it actually sorts out all of the different concepts you need to measure. It doesn't tell you how to measure them. It doesn't define a method. And if I think back to the way, you know, the ABS probably measured GDP in 1956, it would have been completely different. So you don't want to standardise the measurements. This idea of the level one, two, three tier reporting, I think that's right, it's, you get back here. When is data good enough? Uh, and here I think timeliness is everything. I mean, you want a flood warning before it gets to you, okay? So you don't want to know that it's 6.735 metres 20 minutes before you're at five metres. You'd actually much rather know that it was four metres plus or minus two about three hours before. So. Um, now I have gone off track, but I come back here that I think the accounting and so it's these classifications of both the assets 
Okay, so all of your different ecosystems, all of the different ecosystem services, nature-based solutions, whatever, you can, they're known by many different things. They're more or less the same thing. There's about five different classifications for those. Will the real classification stand up? Who is going to standardise? So that's, you know, trying to tie all those pieces together. So I think, you know, so frameworks, methods, tools, initiatives, it's a it's a storm <laughs> and uh, you know, we're looking, everyone's looking for guidance. It seems there's a collection of experience that can be brought together, but how do we do that? But it comes back to one, there's this translation in one sense, are we all talking about the same thing? Are we measuring at the same, measuring the same thing? Uh, but then, uh, I've lost the thread of my thought, but I think it's, it, it comes back to, to many different things and how they get pulled together. And I'm going to stop there because I really have gone off track. Now, I've been told to wrap up, but I'm going to do one last act. Get ready, the other three panellists. It's Christmas in a minute. Um, there was supposed to be a session of takeaways. I, I don't think that's necessary. <clears throat> um, but I'm, I'm going to propose that most of the challenges aren't different in kind than they were 20, 25 years ago. And, um, but we have very different capabilities and much larger opportunities. And... It's not a data or a technical issue as much as a cultural issue, I would propose. But now it's Christmas, and um, I'll, I'll, the, the three panellists, Michael, you just had a one go. So one dot point, what would you like for Christmas in the environmental information space? Just one thing that could be given or changed. OK, huge amount of funding for long-term ecological <laughs> research. Um, I, I think I'd like a a map of Australia where you could go there and find all the data that was there for this point, all historical points, and be able to project what's going to happen in the future. Not easy, I know, but um, I think if we could get there, we would make much better decisions. I think we could, we could create that. That's not a technical issue. Then we'd have some really interesting data mm. questions. Kylie, you're... Uh, for me, um, it's respecting, listening, and collaborating. So I've got three. Um, so it's, it's a chocolate box you're getting. Yeah, isn't exactly. It? So it's respecting, it's listening, it's collaborating with all members along the supply chain. Because unless you're going to have them in the room together to work out where you're going, how you're going to get there, and who needs to be involved, we're going to be still sitting here in, in 20, 30 years. So get into the room, respect each other, really listening, what are their particular problems, um, and working together as a collective force, not just I live and breathe and an expert in here. Have a look at the bigger picture. That's an interesting term to use, supply chain, not used before today, and I think recent Years have shown us what happens if one point in a 27-point supply chain doesn't work. It's, it's not a bad analogy to make people think about back and forward in the, in the process. Jane? Um, I actually concur with Richard. The national map with everything on it would be fabulous, but I don't think I'm going to get that for Christmas <laughs> this year. Um, probably on the pathway to doing that, and this might not be this Christmas either, I would love us to have a national plan for how we share and combine in national environmental data to really build that national map. So that's the big sticking point for me. I think we've all got fabulous shared motivation, but how we translate that into the, what are the steps that we can respectively do in our respective sectors to actually build that map? That actually allows us to say anywhere in Australia, how are we doing environmentally? And to actually stand that up in the next few years rather than when it's all too late. Okay, I think that is the point where we're going to close. Um, I, look, we're all personally more excited about Richard's map, but the national framework for a policy wonk like me, oh yeah, that'd be great. So we'll work on both. Um, could I thank our four panellists? And thank you all, and Rosie, you have a last word. Because if I don't have the last word, who's going to thank Stephen for doing an amazing job? 
Um, I also want to thank our panellists for joining us this afternoon. Um, and as a thank you to our speakers, we are going to be donating to the organisation 15 trees uh, to be planting trees in the Daintree Forest. I also want to thank the ARDC staff that have worked to make this afternoon possible. Um, Keith Russell, Hamish Hollower in looking at the programme. Asha, who is very literally often behind the scenes. Thank you um, for all of your efforts here, Asha. And I also think it's important to recognise the other ARDC staff that don't always get called out. Um, Myra, I'm calling you out. Thank you for being on the desk today. Most importantly, I want to f uh, follow up by thanking those of you that are in the room as part of this discussion to the 60 participants that have been with us uh, during the session this afternoon and the others that have registered and will be getting a copy of the presentation later. I hope that you will go away from this afternoon thinking something that you haven't thought before. We haven't just come together to admire the problem, but you've heard something that's given you an idea or changed your mind, or you're going to take back to the desk and do something about it. And if we do that, then uh, it's, a, it's a brilliant success for an afternoon. I also hope that you will all join us at the ARDC uh, with the Planet Research Data Commons, but also with people and with Hassan Indigenous, our other two research data commons, as we move forward to create enduring national research infrastructure to tackle these really big challenges. So that's my challenge to you and my thanks. <laughs>